I found an old cassette tape in an abandoned mental institution. I never should have listened to it. By Carl B. 1961 Me and my friends Jordan, Ashley and Sam are urban explorers in our free time. You're probably familiar with the type of stuff we do, but in case you're not, we go around exploring abandoned locations, record it on our phones and upload the videos on YouTube. Old abandoned warehouses, amusement parks, industrial complexes, you name it, we've done it. It's a fun hobby, but it can be scary, not to mention dangerous. Some of the places we've explored are condemned structures so dilapidated they look like a strong wind would knock them down. You have to be careful navigating those places and constantly stop to inspect your surroundings. You never know when a rotted stairway might give way under your feet or a rusted catwalk might collapse and send you plunging 50 feet to the hard concrete floor. Not to mention there's always the possibility of running into some strung out drug addict or crazy homeless person squatting there. Plus, what we do isn't exactly legal. We've had some close calls. Once a security guard chases us out of a deserted factory, and another time, Someone actually called the cops on us. Luckily the guy wasn't too much of a hard ass and he let us go with a warning. You probably think we're stupid or crazy to do what we do. Then maybe you're right. But that's just the way we are. We enjoy the thrill of it. Two weeks ago, Sam got a tip on a new place that seemed like primo material for our next video. Especially with Halloween approaching. An old crumbling mental hospital in the next county. It had been built in the late 1800s and had been abandoned for 30 years or so. The early 90s, I believe, and had a pretty sordid past. Supposedly, I was shut down after some kind of scandal involving an investigative reporter who went undercover as a patient and uncovered all kinds of abuse and neglect on the part of the staff. There were even rumours that the doctors were conducting all kinds of fucked up secret experiments on the patients. None of that is substantiated, of course. It's just the type of typical bullshit urban legends that spring up around a place like that. The official story as the hospital was closed due to the government cutting their funding for budget reasons. According to Sam, the place was scheduled to be demolished soon in order to put up an apartment complex, so this was probably our only chance to check it out. So, last weekend, the four of us hopped into Jordan's old Mazda and made a two hour drive out there. The institution was located in a relatively rural area on the outskirts of a city. As soon as it came into view, we knew we wouldn't be disappointed. A forbidding grey stone building, four storeys tall, with narrow barred windows, stood in the middle of a sprawling, heavily overgrown lawn behind a high rusted chain link fence with razor wire coiled over the top. The main gate was adorned with a faded no trespassing sign, marked with a couple 22 bullet holes, and secured with a thick chain and heavy padlock. But after a few minutes of poking around, I actually found a place in the fence where some intrepid explorer before us had snipped a decent sized hole through the chain link fence, probably with a bolt cutter. We slipped through it easily, then made our way up the long overgrown driveway towards the main building. The closer we got, the more creeped out I started to feel. The immense stone building seemed to loom over us, its opposing facade almost resembling a scowling face with many narrow barred eyes, and stared coldly down at the four intruders approaching it. The main entrance doors had been nailed shut at one point, but someone, presumably the same person who cut a hole in the fence, had pried off the sheet of plywood that had once covered them, and they stood wide open, like the gaping mouth of a beast getting ready to swallow its prey whole. We paused for a couple minutes, still about 20 yards away, so that Sam could film Jordan standing in front of the institution as he did a brief intro. Then we closed the remaining distance, all of us with our phone cameras on and recording, and entered the decrepit building. We were in the main lobby slash reception area. The floor was littered with all kinds of debris and trash. Dead leaves that had blown in through the open doors, emptied beer cans, fast food wrappers, cigarette butts, you name it. Presumably stuff that had been left over by kids using the building as a hangout spot and homeless people looking for a place to get drunk and crash for the night. The walls were marked with graffiti. A bedpan, one of those old school steel ones, stood on the reception desk. None of us dared approach it for a closer inspection. We looked for a while and eventually found the main stairway, standing next to the long dead elevators. No electricity. We went upstairs to explore the second story. 
and was the hospital's administrative wing. Offices, mostly. Honestly, there wasn't much interesting in most of them. The place had been pretty thoroughly cleared out when the institution was shut down, and all that remained here was empty filing cabinets and discarded pieces of ancient office equipment. In the hospital director's office, a cardboard shoebox stood open on the otherwise bare desk. I peered inside and saw it contained a number of old audio cassette tapes, still in their cases. I flipped through them out of curiosity. There was a couple dozen of them. They had various names and dates carefully printed on the labels. I didn't know what they were, but some suggested that maybe they were recordings of therapy sessions with former patients. I grabbed one at random and threw it in my pocket to take back with me, just as a souvenir. Then we continue our investigation, filming anything we found that looked even remotely interesting. Truthfully, the whole trip was kind of a letdown. There wasn't much to see or film. The top two floors were patient rooms, but they were almost all vacant except for a couple of rusted bed frames, more litter, and an occasional graffiti artist's tag. The place didn't even have a particularly sinister or creepy ambience once you were inside. There were no operating tables spat with dried blood or rusted surgical implements. Not even a spooky abandoned wheelchair standing in one of the corridors. The institution had been minimum security when it had been in operation, so it wasn't like there had been any especially violent or dangerous patients kept locked up there. In other words, there was no dungeon ward in the basement where the likes of Hannibal Lecter had been imprisoned safely away from the general population. It could have been an abandoned office building for all the atmosphere it generated. After about an hour, we decided to call it quits. Jordan filmed the outro, apologizing to the audience for the video being such a disappointment, and then we left, got back into our car, and drove home without incident. I went on with my normal routine and had pretty much forgotten all about our exploration of the mental hospital until Wednesday morning, when I was getting ready to leave for work. I couldn't find my car keys, which I typically carried in my pants, and was desperately hunting my apartment for them in a rush to not be late. I searched for them in my jacket pocket, not finding them but instead the cassette tape I'd swiped from the institution, and I'd completely forgotten all about it. I had other priorities at the moment, so I just tossed it on my desk for the time being and went on with my search. I eventually located my keys, and they had slipped down my pants and found their way under the cushions of my couch, and got to work only a couple minutes late. That evening, when I got home, I spied the cassette on my desk, and after dinner, decided to give it a closer inspection. It was one of those 9 minute jobs that fit into a full size portable tape recorder, carefully printed on a label by hand in faded black ink, with the words Bennett Michael, and a date, 8 Intrigued, I went into the garage and dug around until I found my dad's old recorder. I popped in some new batteries, then inserted the gazette. I wasn't sure if either the recorder or the tape would still function after all this time, but figured it was worth a try. I plugged a pair of earbuds into the recorder, put them on, and then pressed the play button. For a few seconds, there was only a hissing sound, then a dry clinical man's voice spoke in a professional monotone. The audio quality was still surprisingly clear, and only slightly degraded even after 30 years. Patient 67531, Bennett S. Michael. Session number 7, session being conducted by Dr. Eugene Winters at 2 p.m., on August 17th, 1991. There were a few seconds of hissing silence, then the audio resumed. At first the only sound was a man's heavy, slightly uneven breathing, and the professional, clinical voice from before, the doctor, spoke. How are you feeling today, Michael? The ragged breathing continued. There was no answer. Michael? A second voice spoke. It sounded like it belonged to a younger man. The voice was agitated and tight with suppressed emotion. The voice of a man in turmoil was struggling to maintain his composure. What the fuck do you care how I feel? What does it matter anyway? There's nothing you can do. All you do is ask me the same goddamn questions over and over again, every single time. The emotion behind those words could have been rage. Or something else. It's an integral part of your therapy, Michael. We have to get to the root of whatever is the source for your mental distress in order to give you the necessary treatments you require so that you can fully function normally again and return to society. BULLSHIT! The younger man interrupted with a shout. You just play on my fucking head, like all the other shrinks did. To you, I'm just another freak you can play your little mind games on. Some nut you can exploit to get published in all the big shot medical journals. I'm 
only trying to help you, Michael. A contemptuous snort. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to help me, Doc. There's nothing anyone can do. Please, Michael. You have to work with me if you want to get out of here. You refuse to tell the other doctors what you're so afraid of. What caused you to wake up in the night screaming? Why don't you tell me, Michael? Tell me what you've been so scared of all these years. Several moments of silence. Then the man spoke again. All the rage was gone from his voice. But the fear remained. Fine. I'll tell you. Just so I can tell someone to finally get it out. You'll think I'm crazy. <laughs> but everyone already does. That's why I'm in this loony bin. So why the fuck not? He chuckled humorlessly. He took a few seconds to gather himself before it began. Do you know what it's like to live your whole life knowing the worst thing you could ever know, doctor? The worst thing anyone could ever know? Do you know what it's like to live every... single moment in pure terror? Terror of what, Michael? What if you could see things that other people couldn't? Things that people weren't meant to see. No things humans weren't meant to know. I can see these things, Doctor. It started when I was eight or nine. And that's when I first began seeing them. Them? The Doctor asked. The Forgotten Ones. That's what I call them. They call themselves the Ancient Ones, or the Originals. What are they, Michael? These Forgotten Ones. People talk about hauntings, about seeing ghosts. You hear about it all the time. Some people even claim to be able to communicate with them, channel them for a living. Spiritualists, psychics, whatever you want to call them. Most of them are full of bullshit, frauds. But maybe a few are the real thing. But psychics deal with dead people, human ghosts. The man paused to allow a shaky sigh. <sighs> if it was the ghosts of people... I might be able to cope with that. Maybe I could have gotten used to it and come to accept it with time. But the forgotten ones are not human. And they never were. Go on, Michael. I'm listening. The doctor urged him. They're old. Very, very old. They died long before mankind ever existed on the earth. But before they died... They lived here for a long, long time. The planet is billions of years old, Doc, and human beings have only been around for a couple million. Do you honestly think ours was the first civilization to ever exist? That no one was here before us? They were the original rulers of Earth. They've been dead for hundreds of millions of years, long before ever the dinosaurs came along. But their spirits are still here. They always have been. Invisible to us. Watching us. There is no afterlife, you see. No heaven, no hell. When you die, your spirit is just stuck here. Forever. The Forgotten Ones saw the human race evolve. And they saw our civilization rise. And they hate us. They've always hated us. They see us as intruders. Invaders. Thieves who took the world that was once theirs for ourselves. I see. The doctor interjected patronizingly. Yeah, sure you do. The man muttered cynically. What do these forgotten ones look like, Michael? You don't want to know. The man replied in a strained, trembling voice. They're monstrous, beyond description, and so full of rage and envy and vengeance. I know all this because they tell me. They communicate to you. The doctor asked. Oh yes, all the time. They know I can see them. I can't understand what they're saying when I'm awake. They speak in their own language. But when I'm asleep, they come to me in my dreams. And then I can understand. The Forgotten Ones hate us, but they can't harm us. They can't touch us because they're ghosts and we're alive. We're safe from them. As long as we're alive. But when we die, when our spirits separate from our mortal bodies and we cross over into their realm, then it's payback time. There was a long pause. 
The doctor said nothing to break the silence. The man resumed. Whoever came up with the notion of hell, of demons, of tortured souls and eternal damnation, maybe, just maybe, they caught a glimpse of what the forgotten ones do to the spirits of the dead. That was where the recording ended. The audio cut off and the hissing sounds resumed. I listened for a couple more minutes, but there was nothing else. Then I turned off the recorder and injected the cassette tape and just sat staring at it for a long time, disturbed by what I just listened to. Out of curiosity, I entered Michael S. Bennett and the name of the mental hospital into Google and did a search. I found an obituary in the local newspaper for a Michael Samuel Bennett. He had died on November 11th, 1994 at the age of 31, but the obit didn't say how. I did a bit more digging and found a newspaper article about his death. He had died alone in his apartment of liver failure after a long struggle with alcohol addiction. There was a picture of a man with a gaunt face and dark, haunted eyes. I couldn't find anything to suggest that he had a history of mental health issues or had ever been a patient of the institution. Maybe his family wanted to keep that out of the paper. Maybe the hospital records had been kept confidential. Maybe it wasn't even the same guy. The things that guy said on the tape still creeps me out. He sounded so convinced, so sincere about the things he claimed to be able to see. I tell myself I'm making a big deal out of nothing, that what I had heard had been nothing but the rambling paranoid delusions of an extremely disturbed mental patient, and that's all it is. Right? That's all it can be. Right? <laughs>